I'm Laura Flanders, and this is CityWorks, the show about work and working people. CityWorks is a co-production of the School of Labor and Urban Studies at the City University of New York and CUNY TV. The enormous growth of tech and game companies in recent years is not without criticisms about the rights of workers and the conditions in which they work. What's more, workers are coming forward with pointed concerns about the industry's ethics and culture. The last two years have witnessed a wave of walkouts, petitions, and other workplace actions at video game and tech companies. Despite this activism, employees have yet to form or join a union. A new campaign launched in recent weeks by CWA, the Communications Workers of America, aims to change that. On today's program, we'll be speaking with Wes McKenney, one of the CWA organizers leading a campaign to bring them into the union tent, and with Kevin Akvatsi from Game Workers Unite UK, based in London. Like many new businesses, tech and games defy national boundaries, and that's just part of what is exciting about what is going on. Let's start with you, Wes. Um, just to define terms, when we talk about games, gamers, gaming, we're not talking about Las Vegas casinos, are we? We are not. No, we're talking about uh, the video game industry and the development of those games. So where do these games come from? People know that their kids play them, they might play them, they maybe see the competitions. They don't have much of a sense of what goes into that console in their hands. Sure. So there's, you know, tons of artists, developers, uh, animators, QA testers, you know, that do stuff like, you know, uh, play a game and bash somebody's head against the wall 60 times to see if there's a glitch that'll go through. Um, so, you know, people like that working uh, throughout, you know, sometimes multiple years to try to get these games to market. And to coming to you, Kevin, uh, talk a bit about this whole culture of, of, of video gaming, because again, I think people think of it as fun and games and what a great idea to work in this field. Isn't it an exciting new opportunity for a whole new sort of work? What's the reality? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think lots of people believe that coming in, right, like working in games, making games is their dream job. But once you get into the industry, and I'm like relatively new, I've been in the industry for two years, I'm 21, um, you realize that there's lots of unpaid overtime, high pressure, um, bad planning, cultures of sexism, racism. It's in general, it's an industry as any beginners to be money is king, right? And games make lots of money, more than like film and television combined is what everybody always says. Uh, which means that at the end of the day, these are big capitalistic companies that want to make money and you're part of that making a product. So what you might think of as all about games is really all about money. Of course. I mean, yes. Is this, a st is this true? It makes more money than TV and Hollywood movies combined? Yeah, and it's mostly unorganized. And mostly unorganized. In those industries, yeah. workers have unions, right? And in, in this mm -hmm. industry, they do not. So it's, am I t is it terrible to compare it to kind of the porn industry? Uh, also a huge know. money maker, also bad working Definitely. conditions, and yeah. being massively determined by money. I think the teams, like I think porn, without being an expert in porn making, um, I think porn is produced by very small teams. So it's just being about huge international companies. So this is some of the same abuses and some of the same levels of power, but in a massive industry yeah. involving lots yeah. of workers. So let's start with the top. I, I've heard about this phenomenon of crunch time. And I think that's what Kevin was talking about, this sort of gearing up people working endless hours. Describe that for us, Wes, if you would. What's the problem there? Sure. So, you know, games have deadlines, right, um, that they have to publish at. Yeah. And as it gets closer to those deadlines, you know, workers are okay. expected to work as much as possible to make it happen. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, there's massive overtime. Sometimes it's paid, sometimes it's unpaid. What are we talking about, 50 hours? 80 hours, 90 hours, you know, people sleeping under their desks. And the industry has this pressure, right? Um, Kevin mentioned it. People want to work in the games industry. And the, the industry uses that as sort of this emotional um, manipulation to try to get people to go the extra mile. So in some ways, it's kind of the culture to blame. It, absolutely. It's, it's a toxic culture in a lot of ways. What sort of stories have you heard, Kevin, in the organizing that you do at Game Workers Unite in the UK? I mean, it's because like, I hear stories of people 
planning with over time from the get-go, right? They make a plan on how long will it take to produce this game. And from the get-go, they plan, okay, we can plan with like people working 40 hours, but we could just assume that everybody will work 60 hours or more. And if we, if even that plan fails, where they can work even, even more, um, and then, you know, you, then maybe they order pizza for the whole office a couple of times a week as compensation for the 80 hour week, because oftentimes you don't get overtime pay at all. So no overtime. And then you also mentioned the legal problems. Uh, you talked about harassment and some of the legal challenges people are facing in the workplace. Uh, tell us a couple of stories. Has this ever happened to you, Kevin? Um, legal things that I know of, no. But of course, our union represents cases for, let's say, represented women who are uh, like very severely underpaid um, compared to male colleagues, which is general trend in the industry. There are official numbers from the UK government um, the worst offender is Rockstar, um, a company that has lots of controversy in recent times, but they have a gender pay gap on salary of over 60%. So Rockstar, um, one of those companies, yeah. a pay gap of, did you say 60%? 60% of salary, 80% on bonuses. Is that comparable? Is there anything comparable here? Yeah, I mean, it's common. Absolutely. And, and the wages in the industry just in general are much lower um, than, you know, broader tech in general. So I know that women and others have been raising concerns. I mean, 80 percent on bonuses, 60 percent on salaries. I'm assuming women get together and once they find this out, although that's hard enough, they say, hello, this is a problem. We want to do something. Then what happens? Yeah, well, you know, I, the pay equity is a huge issue, right? And sort of anywhere where workers don't have protections, where they don't have unions, pay equity is always an issue. So, you know, there isn't a lot of pay transparency in the industry. But when workers start figuring it out, I mean, they get upset, right? I mean, we're talking, you know, gross pay differences for women, um, for, um, you know, gender non-binary uh, people. It's, it's just endemic, right? And so there is a lot of energy, there's a lot of activity for organizing. People are getting together, they're forming organizing committees um, across the country at, at multiple studios. But what happens? Are there suits that have been settled? Kevin? So we've definitely um, gotten back pay for some specific cases of our union members. But in general, I think lots of people right now still um, if things are bad at one company, they'd rather switch companies and try to work at another place than improve conditions. I think games workers work at, on average, like two to three companies over like five years. So people change jobs very often and companies very often. When there is a settlement, when there is a lawsuit brought, I understand that there have been non-disclosure agreements that have been getting a certain amount of Definitely. attention in the U.S. campaign scene recently. Yeah. Um, non-disclosure agreements and forced arbitration requirements mm -hmm. written into those um, settlements. To what extent is, is that an issue, uh, Kevin? So companies settle a lot in cases we take against them. They do not at all want any decision that puts them in the negative light on the record, which is nice because we can, we don't need to go through the full legal process to get um, compensation for our members. But on the other hand, the companies can sort of keep a clean record in the public and it's harder. Like I kind of talk a lot about the cases because they are on non disclosure agreements. So, and I cannot mention the company, so I cannot warn the public, so to speak mm -hmm. about them. Well, you did w mention Rockstar. What happened there? Rockstar is a special case because it both had lots of like um, media coverage in, in, the in the video games media, as well as there was the publicly available gender pay gap data, which is collected by the UK government and published every year. So I can talk about these specific public things, but there's stuff about Rockstar there here, like in the rumor mill, that is, especially for people new to the industry, that don't have the connections, they don't know how to find out of a company that seems good is actually good to work at. It's hard to figure out if it's a bad company or not. So, I mean, and presumably, like many gig workers, people go into the game industry without thinking that they are going into a labor-challenged environment. They're probably not experienced in the labor movement, as long as they come from some other unionized shop and come into a gaming industry. There's usually people who've had gig type work, no relation to the labor movement, probably up to that point, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And you know, the industry right now, it has a, about a five to seven year shelf life. That's, that's the average that workers stay in the industry for the reasons that Kevin was mentioning, right? Low wages, having to um, 
no protections, having to switch companies all the time, uh, companies laying people off, right? They put out a title and then they don't have another title coming up or they need less people and they just pink slip people. You know, that, and that's endemic in the industry. And so workers have been able to win stuff. Like they've, they've won uh, at certain studios through different direct actions or through petitioning, have been able to, you know, get crunch things figured out and maybe less crunch or, or you know, uh, change bad managers and stuff like that. But I think that that also is not a, a long-term solution, right? And so the way that a lot of workers are thinking now is how do we build a structure? How do we actually have a democratic system within this industry where we can advocate for ourselves and we don't have to just like, you know, come together um, when something gets egregious enough and do just a walkout? Like how can we actually turn tactics into a strategy? Well, that's where this whole story gets very interesting. So having laid out some of the problems, and I know there are many more, including collaboration with ICE, Immigration Services and others, there is the story of organizing and what you all announced in January, but also what preceded that, which was this grassroots organizing by organizations like the one that Kevin represents. Uh, sure. I mean, um, when Game of Tonight sort of started as like a public movement in last year, I was still like working excessive overtime. So I wasn't even looking at that. Like I was too busy working to even think about what people are doing to improve conditions. But once I was done with that, um, I heard about Game Works Unite going on in, in the US at GDC, a big conference where like 20, 25,000 game developers meet up in, in San Francisco to talk about how to make games. And as part of that, one of the, the trade buddies or the buddies representing the industry and uh, employers and bosses had a round table or panel called something like unions, yes, no, do we need them, don't we need them, are they any good? Um, with them, of course, being like, oh, well, you know, we're not working in a mine, you're not, you're not burning coal out of the ground, so actually you're doing pretty well. You can sort of disrupt the flow, you know, every <laughs> startup driven creative, we don't need this, these sort of restrictions. We're, we're family, family. Family is a big term in the games industry, um, which is what everybody is to their boss and, until it goes to pay or good working conditions. Then you're an employer, an employee. But um, so Game Works Unite was at that panel um, trying to be a counterforce to the sentiment of like, we are too good or we are doing too well to even need unions and put a counter, a worker-based counter perspective to that. And out of that, they got a lot of like um, media coverage and like reaction at, at that location. We formed like a, a, an online chat room to like organize more internationally. Um, and get people involved in this movement, start up local chapters across the world. There, there are some in all over the US, Canada, Germany, UK, Ireland, um, Australia. Excellent. So that begins the story, which we will pick up after a little break. It all got birthed at a trade conference. And you do a wonderful impression of the union rep, I mean, of the company representatives, Kevin. I appreciate that. This, this language of you don't perhaps need a union in this field but it's already spawning union action oh. in other countries and it's about to happen here. So we'll take a quick break and we will come right back. You're watching CityWorks. The CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies is the 25th and newest school under the CUNY umbrella. Dedicated to public service and social justice, the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies offers undergraduate and graduate degrees in the areas of labor studies and urban studies and certificate programs in labor relations, public administration and public policy, healthcare policy and administration, and community leadership. We pride ourselves on being an institution that brings together activists and academics. Find out more at slu.cuny.edu. Welcome back to CityWorks. I'm speaking with Wes McEnany, one of the CWA organizers leading a campaign to bring game workers into the union tent, and Kevin Akvatse from Game Workers Unite UK, which is based in London. So we've been hearing about the, the abuses in this field. This is the field of people who are involved in making the video games that so many of us play. We've heard about some of the beginnings of the organizing that was happening here and there when there was an abuse that was, uh, you know, 
particularly noteworthy, but not across the field. And then a whole lot of attention coming together at a trade fair about a year ago in San Francisco that generated organizing um, in Europe that is now resulted, it seems to me, in an announcement from CWA, the communications workers, just this January, that you are putting dedicated funds and organizing into working with gamers and, I mean, with game makers and other workers in the digital sphere. It's called CODE. What does that stand for? Uh, the Campaign to Organize Digital Employees. So that does sound like it goes beyond sure. just game, the gaming field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who are you covering? Who are you focusing on? So we're, we're talking to all workers in the gaming and tech industry. I'm not going to necessarily go into campaigns of companies that we're involved with workers now, but but yeah, I mean, across sort of across the So we're talking about people who actually do coding, mm -hmm. maybe some artists who design some of the things. Yeah. What about people working in factories producing the consoles? Uh, we haven't talked to any of them yet, but most of those consoles are not obviously produced in the United States. Uh, but, you know, even other people that work at some of these companies. But to give people a sense of the... the yeah. We're not talking about just the people that do coding or just the people Absolutely that do not. design. No. But that's what, no, what noteworthy, yeah. isn't it? You're taking oh, totally. kind of industry-wide approach. Yeah, people ask that question a lot. And, you know, we're, we're talking to people that, you know, maybe they're baristas at some of these big tech companies, right? Uh, we're talking to QA testers, the people that, that test the video games, not the, you know, lauded coders, right? The people that are making um, uh, wage, like The voiceover wage. artists. Right, all uh, voiceover artists actually have organized in California with SAG-AFTRA recently, which is very, very exciting. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, we're talking to all the other workers that are involved in the industry, uh, so in tech broadly. why go that route? Because surely that makes it more difficult. Yeah, well, you know, this is really a culmination of decades of, of CWA being involved in the industry, both in high tech, in telecommunications, uh, most recently through the News Guild with tons of digital uh, uh, journalism properties that have organized. And so our philosophy is that everyone should have a union, right? And everyone deserves a union. And so it's, you know, we're working with these engineers and these high, um, these sort of more well compensated developers, but we're also talking to everyone else in the industry because the reality is, is that all these workers need a union. They can't uh, advocate and take on the industry the way that they need to unless you know they're united together. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that the workers themselves have definitely seen that. And that's not actually as much of an issue with the workers. I think it's more of a projection. Um, and also these companies try to div you know divide people culturally. So in terms of what CWA is putting into this, can you give us some sense of sure. money, manpower, person power? Yeah, so I mean, you, there are countless organizers around the country uh, that are employed by CWA that are already doing some of this work and have been doing some of this work. In addition to that, uh, they've hired myself um, to work on the East Coast and Emma Kanema, who is one of the a, a former game worker, who is one of the founders of Game Workers United (GDC) that Kevin talked about, and so she's sort of um, you know heading up the West Coast. And then we have a lot of cross collaboration, obviously. Uh, but this is the first time I think that a union in the, in the United States has said, "Listen, we're going to put our flag down." And we're actually going to try to help these workers in a true coordinated way to build power in the workplace. And you're not just doing it in the U.S., you're doing it internationally. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we have talking to workers through uni, through our sort of global um, federated affiliate, uh, the workers all around the world um, that are organizing in games and tech, you know, game workers uh, Unite UK. Uh, you know, we're talking to a tech workers union that, that launched a few years ago in Romania, right? Uh, um, and we've had some deep discussions with them, and we're going to continue a lot of the European conversations in the next uh, few months. And Kevin, what does that bring to you? Why is it an advantage to be working in alliance with the CWA here in the U.S.? Or is it? I mean, look, it is. A lot of the big publishers and big companies are headquartered in the U.S., of course. And um, in general, game development is very international. Like the, the kind of games I work on, which are very big games, worked on by hundreds if not a thousand people, they're worked on in countries all across the world, right? You got people creating art in China, maybe. You got people testing the game in Eastern Europe. You got people programming somewhere else. Um, and if everybody working on one game, one game production can pull in the same direction, it is much more powerful than just one, one set of people in one country doing stuff. So I've also been speaking to like, unions like for example prosa in denmark invited me over to talk to them they're also trying to get into games and it's like this um, international cooperation is very important workers of the world unite which brings me to the question of to what degree is this a new era in labor organizing um i was going to say that in a sense you know you're sort of re recreating the 
um, union organizing drives of early Hollywood. Um, but listening to you, I realize actually you're doing something much bigger and different from that, that perhaps is a model for organizing labor in the 21st century. Um, culture often you know, leads the way. We've seen the music industry lead in terms of workers in that industry having to sort of reinvent their economy from the old studio model to the um, self-produced model, self-distributed and um, promoted model. What is significant in what you're doing that you think speaks to not just the specific needs of this industry, but the moment that we're in economically, labor-wise, for labor? Yeah, I, truly, we are in a situation now where these tech companies, their, their goal is disruption of the economy, right? They're trying to replace old industry. And so when we look at in the United States, you know, union density, it's not good. But we also look at the tech industry and there's a lot of tech jobs. One of the reasons why union density is so small is because these jobs have gone to this different industry that's completely unorganized. But I also would say that this isn't a directive from us as much as it's a response from all the self-organizing that's happened. Uh, and we're sort of looking at that. We're looking at workers sort of self-organizing, rising up, trying to form unions, doing walkouts, having moral issues with their employers, right, and, 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 and viewing their work and their labor and what that labor is used for as much of a working condition as anything else. We view all that and say, we're here to try to help these workers. You so know, really the kind of organizing that Game Workers United and others have been doing, sort of self-taught, self-figured out, is what's informing your strategy. Yeah, I, you know, it's like a canary in the coal mine of social change, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, for, for the first time in, in a few generations, workers you know, absent of sort of union presence are taking it upon themselves to, to make this happen and try to reach out to unions, uh, you know, to build skills and build power. So, so that is fascinating. So he says you are in a coal mine after all, Kevin. How does it feel to be the canary? Um, it's very interesting. I, I speak to, a lot of, to lots of like young people who I speak to them about unions. They're like, I oh, yeah, unions. That's this, this thing, right? This, my, my parents are wearing one. I, I, what, what's that about? Like they, lots of people in this industry have never been in a union, maybe don't even know anybody who ever was in a union. Um, so it's very interesting sort of just speaking to people who have like no mental restriction on what a union can be. They're not restricted on what you can demand. Um, I've been looking at digital writing in the US, like places like Vice organizing where they're like, okay, what we want in a, in a union contract is better healthcare for trans employees, for example which is something that I think should definitely be part of a union drive, but it's not necessarily something that like, if you are maybe more restricted by a set notion of what a union can achieve, mm. work hours, pay, might not be on your docket as much, but if you're just like, hey, we can demand what we need, what the working condition we deserve, then if you have a more open mind about it and you come into it with a fresh perspective, you get, I think, more and more interesting uh, approaches. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, I thought he was gonna say because people in this industry don't know people in unions, it makes it a hard sell. In fact, what he's saying is it makes it an easier moment to invent, reinvent what a union might be. Yeah, and what's possible. You know, I tell the story, you know, the New York Times, which is, you know, a member of our news guild, they recently negotiated uh, work uh, diversity stats and quotas, hiring quotas into their contract. Now, of course, maybe a traditional labor union, that's not what might be on someone's mind. But, you know, to Kevin's point, that was a working condition for them. They said, we actually don't want to go into a space every day that is just white and male. And so we're going to use our power to change that, you know. And I think to Kevin's point, younger people in this industry are viewing it that way. They're viewing different forms of, of unionization. Um, you know, solidarity union models um, have been discussed a lot, which is very, very exciting. What does that mean? Uh, I mean, it could look at different, but, you know, non-collective bargaining models um, where, you know, you might not have uh, a collective bargaining agreement with your employer, but that doesn't mean that you can't come together, organize, create democratic structure and run campaigns that you feel to, to change your company as, as you see fit. I'm not a gamer. I don't play games. I know that there is a camaraderie in the game culture. But when I look at it from outside, I think... That is not a, cult a culture that encourages collective action. It's all about competition. The images are all too often smashing someone's head against the wall. Um, there's racism and sexism and war motifs um, throughout. Um, talk to me. Is the culture itself a problem for organizing? 
Yeah, I think that, you know, these are capitalist firms. None of these cultures are, you know, ripe necessarily for organizing, right? Because their sort of existence is to make money and can, can have total control over the workers. But with that said, that also has bred, you know, a good opportunity for organizing. Um, and that a lot of these, a lot of workers are starting to see themselves, you know, as more than just cogs in the system uh, in the games industry. They're, they're the mystique and the uh, prestige of working in video games has wears off pretty quickly. And I think people uh, make a concerted, you know, decision that they're going to stand up for themselves. And to Kevin's point, I think one great thing about what Code is doing is we are talking to workers at the smallest studios and we're talking to workers at the biggest studios and we're helping them strategize the best way for them to be uh, successful. Mm -hmm. But we're not really discriminating against that. We're, we're trying to talk to workers that are, you know, uh, throughout the industry. And presumably give workers a bit more say, might give them a bit absolutely. more say in the actual content of the games. Yeah, absolutely. The diversity of yeah. them at least. All right, well, that is it for this month's edition of CityWorks. Thank you both. It was great to have you. If you have comments or suggestions, write to us. That's cityworks at slu.cuny.edu. For CityWorks, I'm Laura Flanders.